that, but we're going to do next week Wednesday at 9 o'clock. So we'll do next week Wednesday at 9, and we'll, and we'll wrap it up here, and then that'll take us through to the break for June. And then in July, um, Pastor Rody will pick it up, and I think he's going to do the book of Habakkuk. We're going to go to the Old Testament in July and August, and he'll take care of our summer session of Thursday morning Bible studies. Let's open up here with a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump right into it. So let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the blessings of this day, for the blessings that you give to the church, that you give to the church faithful pastors who continue to follow that pattern of sound words and pass on that good deposit, the gospel, to your called people. Continue to bless your church, that you would call faithful pastors, and that you would bring people to the church to hear and receive your precious gifts. Lord, we thank you for all of your blessings and for your mercy that endures forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's take a look here at 2 Timothy 1, verse 13, where we left off last week. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy 1, starting here at verse 13 and 14, where it says, Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit that has been entrusted to you. As we closed last week, we talked about following this pattern, the sound words that you have heard from me, that pastors are not here to be creative, exciting, to have anything novel or new. They're just there to pass off that which has been given to them. And what I want to do here is turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because Paul is thinking of what he said there when he's, when he's wrapping his, up his life here in his last will and testament. This is the last thing he ever writes in 2 Timothy. But he's thinking here of, of something that he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is the great resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, I've got it on page 1222, 1222. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because there's a handoff here that's being made. And we've got the first two generations here in 2 Timothy. We've got Paul. Handing it off now to people like Timothy, Titus, Onesephorus, um, all these people, and then they're going to hand it off, as Paul says, what is we're going to hear today, what you've heard from me, teach it to others, and they're going to hand it off. And we're only here today, as we closed last week, because Paul handed it off to Timothy, who handed it off to other faithful pastors, who continue to hand it off to the next generation. But Paul says, here's what you're supposed to hand off. Follow this pattern of sound words that you have heard from me. Well, what is that pattern? Well, the interesting thing is, what that is, is kind of this pattern of sound words is kind of what we understand today as the creed. It's this statement of belief. What is the Christian faith? And that's being handed off. And you're going to kind of see here echoes of the Apostles' Creed here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel, this good deposit. That's the gospel. I remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you have received. I've handed it off to you, and which you now stand. That sounds like Ephesians. And by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to this word, the pattern of sound words that I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered, I passed off to you as of first importance what I received. So Paul gets it from Christ. Christ gives it to Paul. Paul gives it to Timothy. Timothy gives it to the next generation of pastors who hand it off to the next. And here's this pattern of sound words. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. What does that sound like? The creed. There's the pattern of sound words. I believe in Jesus Christ. Son, our Lord, is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. What's the gospel? What's the good deposit that the church is supposed to hand off? That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And that He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, then to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, died in Christ. If you want to go... If you don't believe it, go check it out. Go talk to them. 
Then he appeared to James, that's the brother of Jesus, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, here's, here's his big ego, I worked harder than all of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you are to believe. There's, there's Christianity. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, according to the scriptures, for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the pattern of sound words. That's, that's the gospel. That's this good deposit that Paul preached. Not only what Paul preached, everybody else preached the same thing. This is what we believe. This is what we teach. This is what we confess. This is what the church is going to have its pastors do and hand off to the next generation. And so that's this good deposit. As we go back now to 2 Timothy chapter 1. So go back there, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 1267. And look again at verses 13 and 14. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that's in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard this good deposit that now has been entrusted to you. See, that's the interesting thing. The pastors have this responsibility. It's, it's, it's the handoff. Here's the next generation. Here's, here's the pattern of sound words. The words of Paul, the words of Jesus. Where do we find that? Right here. Here's what you got. Take it. You hand this off to the next generation. You don't change it. You don't alter it. You don't do anything. In a roundabout way, it's kind of, a, kind of an easy job to be a pastor because we don't have to come up with anything new or creative. Now, the problem is today, everybody on TV wants to come up with something new, something creative, something novel. But really, we're just to take what we have here and just hand it off. That's, that's all we're supposed to do. Guard it. Make sure that nobody's changing it, nobody's altering it, nobody's doing anything new with it. And hand it off. What you've heard from me, hand it off. So the handoff now is being made. That's what we've got. Let's go on to verse 15. But he says, here's the problem. So many people are taking it, and they're changing it, or they're turning away from it. Verse 15, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. So here's the interesting thing. They've turned away. Now, the interesting thing is they've turned away from me. And I think that's kind of the interesting thing is, We've seen so many people are ashamed or embarrassed of Jesus. Now they're ashamed and embarrassed of Paul. And we're going to talk a lot about that today because that's all what chapter 2 is about. Everybody was on board when everything was going gung-ho, when it was very popular to be a Christian. And I think there's tremendous application here for the United States. The 1950s, the 1960s, it's cool to be Christian. All right? In fact, if you want to get anywhere in life, you almost have to be Christian. All right, so I go to church. That's where I make contacts for my business, everything else. It's really cool to be a Christian. In fact, it's, you know, just it's God, uh, uh, American, baseball, apple pie. It's just everything's wonderful. And now all of a sudden, it's not so cool to be Christian. And it wasn't so cool all of a sudden by about the 50s and the 60s A.D., not the 1950s and 60s, but now... 50s and 60s AD, 2,000 years ago. All of a sudden now, the Christians are being persecuted. Paul, the great preacher, is now locked up and bound in chains. And this time, they're not springing him free. This time, he's going to lose his neck. And so all of a sudden now, all the pastors are beginning to say, hey, this was cool when we were going gung-ho, but it ain't so cool anymore, which is, which is a very interesting thing. And so they're all now turning away from Paul. And I think there's a tremendous application there for us today because a lot of people, as I said last week, will take the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount, just the words they like, not the whole Sermon on the Mount, because I always tell people, I just kind of like the Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. My response always to that is, are you sure? Read the whole sermon. Then come back. Read all three chapters. 
Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Then come back and tell me if you like that Jesus so much. They just like the do unto others as you would have them do unto you, turn the other cheek, all this, you know, don't judge others. You know, they know about three sentences from the Sermon on the Mount. But read the rest of it, then come back and tell me whether you like that Jesus. And so, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll take that. But today, most Christian churches are turning away from the words of Paul. They're ashamed of Paul. What do you mean men are the only people who can be pastors? What do you mean homosexuality is wrong? What do you mean there's, there's, there's salvation found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved? What, what do you mean that Jesus is the only way to heaven? We're kind of now today in the 21st century just as embarrassed about Paul, I think, as now people were getting to be ashamed and embarrassed of Paul back in the 50s and 60s A.D. Because now... To be on the side of Paul means it may cost me my life. And so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn away. And Paul calls out two pastors, two leaders of the church there in Asia, which would be, you know, in modern-day Turkey, Asia, Asia Minor, Phygelus and Hermogenes. They, they, they've turned away from me. But then he's going to say, wait a minute here. There is still one who's held on. Verse 16, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesephorus, for he often refreshed me, and he was what? Not ashamed. He was not ashamed of my chains, which is shame, saying the other guys, the other pastors, were ashamed of the fact that Paul is now in chains. And now it's kind of not cool to be a pastor anymore. Now, the interesting thing is church history will tell us that Onesephorus will um, eventually become the bishop in Corinth of the churches that we just read here in 1 Corinthians. So uh, Paul is what? Handpicking all of these people like Titus, Timothy, Onesephorus. All these people will be put in these various leadership positions. People now that Paul what? Trusts. These people will hold the line because everybody else isn't holding the line. See, we think, oh, my gosh, look at the church in America today. It's going to hell in a handbasket. Oh, this is horrible what's happening. Well, my goodness gracious, these people are actually talking with the Apostle Paul. And they're what? Caving. Everybody. I mean, it's a, that's a, I'm sure there's a little bit of hyperbole there because Paul is prone to hyperbole. You know, you're aware that all, everybody in Asia is turned away from me. Uh, it's probably a little bit of exaggeration there. But there's probably a lot of truth that everybody is ditching him. And he's now all alone, which is why, you know, we'll get to that next week when we finish up in chapters 3 and 4. I'm sitting here all by my lonesome. So please, Timothy, come to me and bring Mark and, and bring my cloak because it's getting cold. And I, I don't want to just, you know, freeze to death down here in the dungeon and bring the scriptures. But all these other guys have ditched me, except for this Onesephorus. He often refreshed me back when I was in Ephesus, and he was not ashamed of my change. Now, the interesting thing is church history will say he'll become the bishop of Corinth, but then he finds his way back to Ephesus again later on in life. I don't know if it's after Timothy was martyred, because remember, he got his head chopped off and he was diced up into many pieces. But then eventually Onesephorus makes his way back, to Ephesus, and he too is killed there. So, you know, all these people who are major players, Timothy, Onesephorus, Titus, all these guys will die for the faith. And so they're knowing what it's, what it's going to cost them, and they're going to remain faithful, which is what we get in Revelation. Remember the letters to the churches, be faithful even unto death, and you will receive the crown of life. So verse 17, he arrived in Rome, and he had to actually search for me earnestly, and he found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. What day is he talking about? That judgment day. day. Judgment day. May God, may, may God give him mercy on judgment day. Yes, Kyle. Well, in the notes point to uh, Jesus' discourse in Matthew chapter 25 where he talks about uh, when I was hungry, you fed me. Yeah. yeah. When I was naked, you came and visited me. Right, yeah. And this is what it looks like. Because, you know, there's the interesting thing is, 
we think, you know, we're, we're there going to look for the guy who robbed 18 banks, you know, and everything else, and then we're going to go and we're going to minister to him in jail or the guy that uh, killed five people. Now, should we be doing that? Yes. It's what Chaplain Garricky did even at the Nuremberg trials. You know, the U.S. Army uh, chaplain who was an LCMS pastor from Missouri who went and ministered uh, on death row to all the Nazi war criminals. Should we be doing that for even the hardened murderer? Yes. But the connotation we have here, as Kyle brought up, in, in the New Testament is going and visiting what? The Christians who are being put into jail for being a Christian. Not for being an axe murderer or robbing 15 banks or anything. These are people who were falsely put into prison because they confessed their faith. And if you went and visited them, it actually meant that you too were one of them. And it might cost you your own life. But you were willing to do that because what did Jesus say earlier? For those of you who are ashamed of me and my words, I'll be ashamed of you when I come again in glory with the angels on the last day. Jesus, it's interesting, you're ashamed of me and you're ashamed of my words. Paul says, what's the problem? You're ashamed of me right now and my words, because they're the words of Jesus. And so there's, there's that whole situation. I think that's where I was going to go as we end chapter one. It's kind of the application there, and it's that challenge. It's easy to be ashamed today of Jesus and his message and his words. Today. Just as it was easy to be ashamed of Paul and his message. It's, it's easy to be ashamed of, of Timothy's mentor and message. And, and, and they're probably sitting here and Timothy and all these pastors like Phygelus and Hermogenes are sitting here thinking, golly, in the eyes of the world, this Christianity looks like defeat and disaster if I join it. In this world. In this world. But that'll take us to our gospel reading here from John 16, where we're going to keep going on where um, our seminarian, Jason, uh, was preaching last week where Jesus will say this Sunday, in this world you will have trouble. You will, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's, that's the comfort that we hold on to. Because these pastors are probably sitting here saying, where's, where's the success? Where's the, where's the success now? If Paul is God's hand-picked apostle, and now he's going to lose his life, I don't know if I want to be a part of this group. That's, that's, that's the question now as we end chapter 1 that I think is it's why I chose this. I think the application is coming here in the United States where it's here. It's that, that, that persecution is beginning to be there, but it's soft, especially in the business world, in the academic world. I mean, I have people all the time. I just talked to somebody in my office Tuesday morning whose daughter works for Eli Lilly. And they were talking to me, and it was all about you got to go to these classes to get in and all the woke stuff and everything else, and you've got to be happy with what's going on. And it was all about how they sent out a corporate email this past week about how evil white people are. And you look at how what white people caused with you know the shootings and Buffalo and everything else and that stuff, and that's because it's all these white people are just spewing hate on the internet, and we got to make sure that. As a corporation, we're opposing that. And this person comes and talks to me Tuesday and says, you know, my, my child is just sitting here um, saying, can't we just, you know, sell stuff, drugs to help people? Why do we got to sit here and constantly go to classes and hear all the woke garbage and kind of everything else? But that's, that's kind of exactly, you know, where we're at here. And if you want to stand up against all that, it may cost you, it may cost you your job. I mean, I, I remember I had the chairman of my congregation was an engineer for Cummins uh, diesel engines down in Columbus when I was in southern Indiana. And he was constantly coming into my office. And I had one of my elders' wife was a big person in HR for Cummins. And she constantly had to come in and they had to do all of this woke LGBTQ plus stuff training constantly. It was every quarter they had to go and watch movies. And this guy came in who was an engineer and said, Pastor, I actually had to walk out. He goes, it was the most perverted stuff. He goes, it was porn. It was homosexual porn that we were basically having to watch some of these clips. And he said, I cannot be subjected to this. 
And he said, I actually had to walk out. I couldn't take it anymore. If I lose my job, I'll lose my job. But I just, I just, I just couldn't take it. Because the interesting thing, down in Columbus, in Cummins, you think of diesel engines, you kind of think of Tim the Toolman Taylor and, you know, men and everything else. But it's, a, it's an incredible thing that uh, the LGBTQ plus crowd has, has, has gotten a hold of Cummins so bad. And all the offices are now just being filled with LGBTQ plus people. And they're just, and they're just hammering everybody with this stuff. And, and so it's, it's right now, it's, it's kind of soft. It's not going to cost you your life. It may cost you your livelihood or your job, but it's, it's, it's out there, and they're just ratcheting it up every month just a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more to see how far they're going to get away with all this stuff. Because most people worry, I just, I'm going to sit there, I'll close my eyes, I'll do whatever I can because I want to keep my, I want to keep my job. And we'll just have to see where it goes. Tom, did you have something? Yeah, was he the only guy that walked out? Or the I don't know. I didn't, I didn't ask him. I think I was the only one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, it's like he said, we're, we're, we're selling diesel engines. You know, can we just, can we just sell diesel engines? Yeah. I mean, why do we have to do all this? He goes, I'm not going to hurt them. I'm not going to say anything derogatory towards people who maybe have that persuasion. I think it's wrong. I think they need to repent, but I'm not going to, but why do you have to keep hammering with this stuff? And it's, it's, yeah, Gene? I watched the movie yesterday that got my Christian persecution, and it had to do with the Apostle Jose Aguilar in 2012 when he was on trial in Indonesia. Mm-hmm. But it talked about that the sheriff in Mexico in 1976 or 1979, where I guess the Mexican government didn't like the influence of Rome. Yeah. Well, there's not so much more to say about being killed or being just hung from railway posts, you know, from uh, telegraph posts and all of that stuff. Yeah. Just the whole revolution itself at that point brought a lot of people back together. Because of the position the government took, I think right. at that point it just went away. And I think we're going to see it. it. It's there in academia. It's there in our schools. It's there now in the corporate world. Um, and it's going to be there too on the uh, on the web with social media and kind of the tech companies and everything else. And so we'll just we'll just have to see where it all goes. Sue, did you? My I guess my comment is why is so much interference with so many sexualities as a human being? Uh, uh, why, why is it brought so forth that it's because it's just the it's it's kind of. I know. Uh, I mean, the o- it's, it's wrong to be married and holding hands, but it's all right for them to be out there actually making out <laughs> with a man or a woman. And, when you know, but, and it happens so much stuff just a few minutes of their lives out there. There's so much more to it all right. than proof to yourself. You know, but, but everything now has become sexualized, and that's Satan. That's, that's, that's Satan and what he's trying to do to destroy society. Because you're not, you're, not, you're not who you are by your sexual activity. But we have now identified ourselves by our sexual, I, yeah. It, it's, it's an amazing thing. As Christians, we are a baptized child of God. That's who we are. We're not heterosexuals. I'm, I'm, I'm a baptized child of God. That's my identity. But for the world, I'm going to, my identity is what I do with my genitals, which is the most, it, it is. That's what, you know, we've been talking about at pastor's conferences, how, how, asking that same question, how did we get to this point? But again, it's almost become, what we've talked about on Sunday, we've become nothing more than animals. Animals with regards to, I am now going to identify myself through my urges and instincts, which, which is of or pertaining to the lower animals. So, I mean, when you, when you, when you look at it that way, it, it helps you to somewhat answer the question, somewhat. But you can see where we're heading 
It's to pull us away from what we were created by God to be. And, and Satan is attacking that in every manner and well, form. Culturally, Mark's all about sex and division and this and that. Right, right. Yeah, there's... And, and it's you know, having an effect upon the church, the Christian church. Is evil. Right, because we're trying to show ultimately that, you know, gender, which we, we read in Genesis, is wired into creation. It is so obvious. But if we can even destroy that, then there's just another way that Satan says there's no reason for God. Just as he tried to with Darwin almost 200 years ago now in the 1830s, if I can come up with a theory that explains how everything got here without God, I don't need him anymore. Which is a theory. Right, which is a theory. It's a, it's a theory that is actually the most unscientific theory on the face of the earth. It, there is no science whatsoever to back it up because the laws of science and the laws of lo logic junk it from the very beginning because you can't get something from nothing. Now tell me you get everything out of nothing. The first law of logic, if you take a philosophy or a logic class, is if there was ever a time when there was nothing, there will always be nothing. That's the first law of logic. So logic and science actually tells you this cannot happen. I mean, it's the law of biogenesis says something can't come from nothing either. You can't create out of nothing. So the laws of logic, philosophy, and science tell us evolution could never happen. And then you look at the laws today of biochemistry, genetics, and everything else. Mutation doesn't add information to a system. It decreases it. Therefore, you can't have evolution on a large scale. I mean, it's, it's, it's unscientific. But Satan is promoting the lie because the whole goal is to attack the scripture, the pattern of the sound words from the very beginning of Genesis 1 and 2 that we've been reading in our Sunday morning Bible study that we're to hand off. And if I can say that God wasn't here and didn't create the world, then there is no God. And that's the ultimate, the ultimate thing to attack is to attack the foundation. We think, too, in the Christian church, we make a lot of mistakes that we think we're fighting the battle on abortion or LGBTQ plus or everything else. What we're battling is, did God really say this? And the battle isn't so much with the world, once again. The battle is within the church because most of the church says Genesis 1 and 2 is myth. That's the, that's the problem. Genesis 1 and 2, and if it is, then you can be gay. You can be whatever. You can be a man and decide that you want to be a woman, which is what most churches today say it's okay. And we will totally back you up on that. The Presbyterian USA Church, the Methodist Church, the ELCA, the Anglican Church, the Episcopalian Church, the UCC, you can just go down and they all back all the whatever it is that's going on. So it's not just corporate America that's bought into it. It's mainstream USA Christianity bought into all this garbage too. I would argue Correct. And right. No, it is. And so they buy into it. Um, and I'll get that, too. I'll have people come into my office and they'll say, hey, pastor, my brother is a pastor in such and such a church. And he's reading the same Bible that you're reading. And he says the exact opposite of what you're saying. So are you telling me he's not a Christian? See, that? oh, boy, here we go. You know, and there, there, there we're at. He's a Christian pastor. He went to seminary. Now, not your seminary, but he went to a seminary, too. And so are you, you you're telling me that he doesn't know what he's talking about? He's been a pastor for 40 years. All right. I would be happy to sit down and debate him. I'm more than happy to talk. But again, it'll go back. Do, do you want to believe what's here? That's, that's ultimately. It, it, do you want to follow the pattern of the sound words? This is sound. Because the thing is, is it makes sense again. When you look at where we're at today, it's unsound. It's actually insanity. When we, when, we, when we get rid of this, we end up what we have, what I was talking about Sunday when you turn on the news, and I go and visit everybody, and they say, Pastor, I don't understand what I'm seeing on the news. Well, it's what happened when we get rid of this, and now it's unsound. It's crazy. Or the Bible would say, from the original languages, it's insanity. That's what ends up happening when we get rid of the pattern of sound words. And we lose the fear of God. When we lose the fear of God, the ultimate result is 
not knowledge, it's insanity. Because what do you have in Proverbs and in the Psalms? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. When we lose God, we lose all wisdom, and it leads to total insanity, which is what we're seeing on a daily basis on your phone, your TV, your computer, wherever it is that you consume your news, that's, that's what we're seeing. I mean, it is. You just, you, I want to mention it in the sermon. You almost wake up every day. What sort of kooky, chaotic thing am I going to see today? I mean, it's almost, and it's almost like we're watching now the book of Revelation. Famine, plague, pestilence, you know, what's entering stage right today? You know, what is the topic of weird stuff today that's going to happen? I mean, that's almost where we're at. But when we get rid of God, and then as I said over the last two Sundays, when we take man off of the throne that he was placed upon as a lowercase king to where he's supposed to be now, being this total 100%, but now the fallen sin he can't be, but this reflection of God as he's created in the image of God, and now we just become nothing but animals run by our urges and instincts. But notice how Satan never says, I want you to run by your urges and instincts. Now today he says, why, well, how is it? And they're all, they all say the same thing. I want to be true to my authentic inner self. In other words, that is your sin. That's what I want to be true to. And they're doing a good job. And they're doing a good job of it. But see, notice he doesn't say, follow your inner sinful urges and passions. That's what the Bible says. It, he'll, he'll tell Paul, or Paul will tell Timothy here in a moment in chapter 2, flee from your youthful urges and passions. Flee from them. Now you turn on your TV or you look at social media, follow your authentic inner self. Now, if you unpack that, it means follow your inner sinful urges. The Bible says the exact opposite. Flee from them. And he's going to tell Timothy, Timothy's a pastor. Flee from those. And see, that's, that's, that's my thesis is, is what Kurt has said. The problem we're seeing today, we always want to, it's Washington. It's whatever your persuasion is. It's Trump's fault. It's Biden's fault. It's Obama's fault. It's Bush's fault. It's Clinton's fault. It's Reagan's fault. Wh whatever we always, it's Mitch McConnell's fault. It's Chuck Schumer's fault. It's Nancy Pelosi's fault. It, who, who's ever, it's somebody up there in Washington. No, the, the interesting thing is it's the church because the church is always supposed, as it did in the Old Testament, it was the pastors, it was the prophets, were always to speak to the government. You're wrong. They weren't to take over the government because that's an established kingdom of God. But you to say, hey, repent. Now, for most of the guys like Isaiah and everybody, cost Elijah, he got taken up in the, in the whirlwind in the fiery chariot. But a lot of them, it all cost them their lives. But the church was to constantly say, no, 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 you're wrong. Let's go back and look at the word of God. And the church today isn't doing that. The government's going and saying, and notice they'll always do that. Well, the church and the pastors say that it's okay. This started, though, when I was young. Oh, it's been going... It's been going on for, well, it, it, I mean, it was, it was there. We always think that the, the heydays were the 50s and 60s. That's when the church was totally corrupt. What was happening was we were living off of the borrowed capital of previous generations. But you have the brief statement by the Missouri Synod in 1932 saying that the church is going to hell in a handbasket, that we're getting rid of the scriptures. This is before, this is before even World War II. You've got J. Gresham Machen writing his, his classic treatise, Christianity and Liberalism, back in the 20s, saying we've lost it because we did. We started selling out in, right after the Civil War in the 1870s and 1880s with the Industrial Revolution, with now Darwinism and evolution coming, and science, and we wanted to get on board. And it was the whole idea that we're moving in a way with technology and science and everything else that we've gotten rid of God. The technology and the science allowed us to kill over, over a billion people in the, in the, in the 20th century. I mean, we, we probably may be knocking on the door of 2 billion because we aborted a billion babies worldwide in the 20th century. Now you look at all the wars and everything else and the ethnic cleansings and everything else, we probably killed 2 billion people. 2 billion people, man, murdered 
in the, in the 20th century. So our technology didn't allow society to become wonderful. Yes, vacuums and, and, and uh, you know, refrigeration and, and vaccinations and all that, yes, helped. But for the most part, our technology allowed people with power to kill tons and tons and tons of people. And so we've already watched this movie before and we've seen where it went with World War I, II, Korea, Vietnam, and everything else. But the interesting thing is, in this life, is Christianity ever going to be popular? No. And even in the 50s and 60s, uh, American Christianity that was popular was a civil religion. It was kind of like, if you're an American, you'll be a Christian. But it wasn't so much Jesus going to heaven. If you actually, my dad will talk about this, listening to the sermons in the 50s and 60s throughout the United States and then actually going because he went to Concordia High School in Fort Wayne and then he was down in Florida for a while when my grandpa owned a couple businesses in Florida they moved down there for six seven years and then moved back to Fort Wayne because my my family was all from St. Paul's in Fort Wayne and and uh, that's where my grandma was was baptized and my whole family there and then my grandparents were married there and my all my uh, uncles and my dad all graduated from Concordia High School but he said even in Fort Wayne listening to the sermons in the 50s and 60s and early 70s it was all a lot of morals. It was just, you know, be a nice person. Treat others the way you would want to be treated. Even the sermons, and that was kind of the U.S. Christianity. Be nice. Be nice. And, and you know, and, and you even watch that if you watch the 50s and 60s and watch, like, Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best and everything else. Notice even in all those, the dads and the moms never went to church. They sent Wally and Beave to Sunday school, and then they talk about, well, what lesson did you learn in Sunday school? Well, we're supposed to forgive others. We're supposed to treat others nice. You can kind of even begin to see how it was there in the 50s and 60s in the U.S. Christianity. It was more moralism. It wasn't the pattern of the sound words of the gospel that Jesus died for your sins according to the scriptures. Now, you got that in some churches, but kind of the U.S. general Christianity was just this be nice to one another. And that we can tolerate. But to say Jesus is the only way to heaven, well, that was even kind of a little divisive in the 50s and the 60s. And so often what we kind of think was the heyday of the 50s and 60s wasn't maybe so much of the heyday. Because if it was a big heyday, we wouldn't have had the late 60s and the early 70s. If we were passing on this sound teaching, we wouldn't have had the late 60s and the 70s, and we wouldn't be having what we have today. If the churches were doing such a bang-up job of passing all this along, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in the position that we were in. So it's kind of a sad indictment, but the problem is, again, with people like me and, and the churches. The pastors in the churches weren't handing it on the way we should have been, and that's what got us into trouble. Yes, Tom? Yeah, I was wondering, uh, you know, when Billy Graham had the crusades and everything, uh, you know, through the country and everything, and, and the baseball uh, stadiums and all mm -hmm. that. Oh, with the, the lady he with the satanic there, stuff? I yeah. Yeah. Even pointed at the beautiful girl. Yeah. Was that, was that guy uh, sent there by the devil, or what, what was going on there? I, I, we didn't, it was pretty scary. Like it, yeah, there was a lady came with a pentagram thing, and in the name of Satan, she was uh, revoking the church and Jesus, and she was in the parking lot. Um I, yes, I think, I mean, I can't say 100% definitively was she possessed. I think, you know, Sonia asked me a lot of questions about that, too, because, I mean, uh, it was a... It was did a, you see that? Yeah, yeah. And she was kind of wanting to know whether she was going to have to call the police or not and everything oh, else. So she was kind of watching it, and um, there's probably drug use that's probably a part of that, too. Um, so there's, there's a combination of a lot of things that are there. Yeah. Let's, let's jump in here to chapter 2. Let's jump into chapter 2 and look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And let's start here with the, with the first couple verses. 
you then, my child. There's a you then. You then, this is, this is the problem. You know, going back here at the end of chapter 1, Phygelus, Hermogenes, all the people in Asia, you, they, they've, they've turned away from me. They haven't followed the pattern of sound words. They're ashamed of the gospel. They're ashamed of Christ. They're embarrassed by the whole thing. They're also having, remember, at the start of chapter 1, they're, they're being overrun by a spirit of fear. Those are those people. But now, Timothy, you then. So we kind of had chapter 1 was, here's the problems that Paul's facing in his day. As we've seen, I think, it's a mirror of where we're at in our generation today and where every generation is at, in all honesty. So he says then, you, my child, here's what you're going to have to do so that what happened to them doesn't happen to you because this is my concern. I'm dying, and I will die. That's, we'll get to that next week, chapter 4. I'm being poured out as a drink offering. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. I've made it to the finish line. But, Timothy, I'm worried about you, whether you can make it to the finish line and whether the people you're going to preach to are going to make it to the finish line and are going to not be embarrassed, not be ashamed, not fall by the wayside and turn away from Christ in his words. So you then, my child, remember, spiritual child, be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, when I'm weak, then I'm strong, because I rely not on my own strength, but on the strength of Christ. The only way you're going to make it is to be strengthened by Christ. And how are you going to be strengthened by Christ? Verse 2, by what you've heard from me. Not because it's from Paul, but Paul got it from whom? We just read it in 1 Corinthians 15. I have passed on to you what I have received from Jesus. That's Galatians chapter 1. I went out into the desert. I was in Arabia for three years, and I had all the either personal interaction face-to-face -face with Jesus or visions or a combo deal, which is what I think it probably was. And so I got this. So then now I got it straight from the horse's mouth from Jesus. This is what I was commissioned to preach. This is what I've handed on. This is what you need to hand on. So you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. So all these people are supposed, they have heard it, and they're going to check to make sure, Timothy, that you're what? Being faithful. Because everybody has heard what I've preached. So that if you change it, Timothy, you're going to be in big trouble. You've, you've heard this. It's been, it's been, it, you've heard it from me in the presence of many witnesses. Now, what's your job? What's your job? Entrust it to what? To faithful men. Entrust it to faithful men. You, you, you've heard it in the presence of many witnesses. You can't change it. And you're going to have, the only way you're going to do this is to be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. That's Paul's most famous words, is being in Christ. He's the one that, 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 that coined that. In the, in the New Testament, being in Christ. How are you in Christ? You're baptized, as he says in Romans 6. I'm baptized into Christ. That puts me now in Christ. In Christ, I am a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. I'm in Christ. Remain faithful in that baptismal faith that God has given to you. What makes men faithful there? All right, in verse 2, entrusted to faithful men. What makes them faithful is they're just passing on what they've been given. It's not actually their skill. It's not, it, it helps if you got some skill. But what actually makes you a faithful pastor is you're passing it on. You're not changing it. You're not altering it. Pass it on and give it to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The teaching there is they know this, and they're going to pass it on. Now, is this job going to be easy? No. So then he says, here's what you're going to need to do it. We're going to, we're going to entitle this, or we're going to look at this very quickly. 3D discipleship. He's going to give us, to be a pastor, it's kind of like three other jobs. Three other jobs. And he's going to say, as he always says, being a Christian means you're going to suffer, but being a pastor also means you're going to suffer because, number one, you're going to be sharing, as we talked about last week, in the suffering of your people. 
And just as Christ suffered, you're going to suffer because you're going to pick up the cross and you're going to be following the crucified one. But now being a pastor means you're going to have to have kind of the traits of three other jobs that are going to, and we're just going to put them on the board, three Ds. You're going to have total devotion. There's going to be a ton of discipline. And what did I put down here as the third one? Oh, diligence, diligence. You're going to have a ton of diligence. Now, what are these three jobs that we have here? He's going to use three illustrations, starting at verse 3. Share in suffering. Now, wh why, do you think he, why do you think he starts that way? Because let's go back and remember, you then, my child, don't be like those other people, Phygelus, Hermogenes, all those other people all ditched and deserted me and abandoned me over there. You then are going to be different. What's going to make you different is you're willing to what? Share in the, the suffering. That you're not going to be a Time Magazine's man of the year. All right? You're not going to be, like I said last week, you're not going to be on NPR. You're not going to be on uh, 95.3 WMNC. As I said last week, I was listening to somebody, I can't remember who it was, interviewing this lady who was an actress. Oh, I just, through the pandemic, I've learned to be so spiritual and religious. I've learned to center my life through meditation and everything else and doing yoga and, and finding my inner energy that's in the core, in the center of my being. Okay, and everybody, oh, people call in, oh, you're wonderful, you're great, thank you for giving me this. It's going to help me with the stress and everything. Notice that she's a hero, but if you put a pastor on there that said, what you really need to do is repent or you're going to die, nobody's going to sit there, oh, you're wonderful. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to get that. So you're going to get, instead, suffering. So be ready to accept that and share in that. Number one, verse three, as a good soldier. That's the first one, devotion. Devotion to duty. That's as a, as a soldier. A soldier doesn't get involved, Paul says, and entangled in civilian pursuits. There the picture is, he's not going to be running around in the marketplace trying to make a whole bunch of cash. He doesn't have enough time. He's a soldier. He's a soldier whose aim is to please the one who enlisted him. His aim is to please the centurion. Today we'd say the sergeant, his captain. That's, that's his job. His job is to do what his sergeant tells him to do. Not, oh, sergeant says, sarge says I'm supposed to be doing this. No, I can't because I've got to go to the marketplace. I've got a deal I've got worked out here this afternoon. No, wait a minute. Sarge says I gotta go do this. No, I'm sorry, Sarge. I, I got a deal in the marketplace I gotta, I've got to take care of. So Paul says, no wait, there's a devotion here to duty and the soldier always does what his commanding officer tells him to do. You as a pastor are always gonna do what God tells you to do. Not what you want to do, but what God tells you to do. That's the first one, devotion to duty. The next thing is discipline. It's the, it's, it's the athlete who is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. No illegal shortcuts. No steroids. No, it's, it's not true anymore, is it? That, you know, my, my brother was a very good baseball player. Uh, played for one of the U.S. national teams abroad back in the late 90s. Uh, had a very good college career. Played professional baseball. He, eventually, he was traded in the minor leagues, and then uh, he didn't want to report. It's a long story. And he finally just said, I'm going to quit. Um, and it's interesting. There was a guy from Duke um, that was cut with him eventually at the end and traded. Uh, he was with the, in the, kind of the Montreal Expos system there for a while and then went and played in the Frontier League uh, for Springfield, Illinois. Uh, but the interesting thing was is both of those guys, my brother and this other guy from Duke, got along really well. They were both Christians. But the reason why that they eventually got traded and then released is neither of them would take steroids. My brother said we were the only two clean guys in the clubhouse. We were the only two clean guys. He said it was everywhere. And he said in the late 90s, drugs were more prevalent 
in the minor leagues than I think even in the major leagues because everybody was trying to get there. And he said uh, it was there it, after games, before games, your assortment of pills to pick up, your uppers to get you going before the game, you know, your stuff, steroids, everything else. He goes, it was the most dirty thing you could ever see. And basically, I was taken aside before I was released and said, hey, if you want to continue in professional baseball, you got to do two things. Number one, you got to get quicker and you're going to have to get stronger. And you and I both know there's only one way to do that. Take the stuff over here. All right. But they didn't tell him that. But, you know, so that they could never be implicated. But, you know, all these people in baseball want to talk about the athletes who were dirty. Let's, let's sit here and say the people who own the teams and everything else, I mean, they always want to run, oh, we didn't know. It was, they all knew it was going on. I mean, everybody, everybody knew it was going on. But my brother always said, I wish I could have played on an even playing field. And actually to where everybody was on an even playing field. And then I would have loved to see whether I could have made it or not. Because I'll never know now because I was clean and everybody else was dirty with all the solved stuff. And so, Kurt, you're right. I mean, it's not, you know. But back then, especially for the Olympic Games, there was all these rules for training and in the games themselves. And so Paul uses the illustration here of an athlete. An athlete's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. There's no illegal shortcuts here. And, and, and the same goes here for a pastor. There's no illegal shortcut than to what? You actually got to sit down and be disciplined to what? Study, study this. There's no shortcut, just like an athlete, unless you sit there and practice every day and you've got the devotion and the diligence. You're never going to make it. And then the final thing he says in verse 6, it's the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. As a pastor, he says, don't be lazy. All right? And there's no shortcuts. He's going to tell, you know, Timothy and others, discharge the duties of your office. Be devoted. Keep a steady head, we're going to see next week. Do, remember what I said. Be like the soldier. Be like the athlete. Be like the farmer. If the farmer never gets up and does anything, he's not going to what? He's not going to eat. I think that's the problem with America today. America was really, and I've told people this, this is my mom's theory. You know, she grew up on a farm in Iowa. Everybody in the family was an Iowa farmer. And she goes, you know what? When most of America was tied some way to agriculture, you saw that you had to work. You had to work. And the kids understood what it was to work and everything else. And when we lost that tie to the ground into agriculture, you, you go back 100 years, 150 years, 70% of the U.S. was tied to farming, some sort of agriculture. And when we lost that, we lost the work ethic to a certain, it's not entirely the case. You can blame everything on that, but it's a, it's a big part of the puzzle here. And th that's why Paul says, you know, if the farmer doesn't go out and work, he's not going to have a crop. And notice what Jesus going back says, what? A farmer goes out to sow the seeds and the seed is the good deposit. It's the gospel. That's the pastor going out to what? Sow the seed. You got to be out there and you got to be doing it. Paul is just, there it is, soldier, an athlete, a farmer. This is what it means to be, yes, a pastor, but it's also the diligence of being a Christian, of being a Christian. It's not just pastors. You must have devotion, you must be disciplined. Um, it used to be that you had what was called the spiritual disciplines that were taught by pastors to the parishioners. They had manuals of piety. We even had that in Lutheran Christianity that one of the famous pastors, Pastor Gerhardt, did his manual of piety. You, you, you get up and you, you, you read scriptures. You pray. It was all of these things that there was some devotion. You know, there was diligence. There was discipline. Just as if you want to be an athlete, you have to be disciplined. Why do we think that if we're a Christian, you don't need any discipline? You don't need a, a schedule of prayer, reading the Bible, going to church on a regular basis to receive word and sacrament ministry. So it's not just pastors. This is for everybody. And when we're, when, when we're not doing any of this, you can kind of see what ends, up, what ends up happening. So 
That's why Paul says in verse 7, think over what I say. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So then he goes on to verse 8, and he says here, remember Jesus Christ. I, I, I think that's just an awesome thing. He, he, he's he's kind of laid out, there's a lot of problems going on here. This is what you need to do. But in the end, what again is the only thing really we need? Jesus. Remember Jesus Christ. Risen from the dead, he's the offspring of David. Why the focus that when he says, remember Jesus Christ, why is the first thing that he says after the comma after that, remember Jesus Christ, here's what you should remember about him. He's risen from the dead. Why does, it, why does he focus in on that? Because if Christ wasn't risen from the dead, then there is no resurrection of the dead, and then out of faith is born again. Right. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah. That pattern of sound words. And he's also giving that comfort that, yes, Timothy, you, you will die for the faith, which he does. Onesiphorus will die for the faith. Almost all of them will die for the faith. But remember, Jesus rose from the dead. And if he lives, we shall live also, because I am the resurrection life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He's, he's risen from the dead. He's the offspring of David. There we get the two natures of Christ. Risen from the dead, only God can rise from the dead. But he's also the offspring of David. But that's a loaded term that he's man here. But really, the offspring of David is that he's the Messiah. And all the Old Testament promises are true and fulfilled in the person of Jesus, who has come to conquer sin and death, and Jesus is also God. That's what you're going to be preaching, because that's what he says here. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering right now. I'm suffering right now, bound with chains as a criminal. This is what it got me. That's what Paul is saying. I preach Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. He's the Messiah. What did it get me? Nice retirement, villa in the Mediterranean, a spot on Fox News every night as a consultant, all right, to where I'm, I'm making, or Tom Brady's new gig when he finally decides to hang it up. Maybe he'll play until he's 55, I don't know. But, I mean, I love this new gig that whenever he quits now, what's, what's Fox News or Fox Sports now guaranteed him? 10 years, $350 million, $35 million a year to be an analyst. All right, so he's got, he's got a, a third of a billion dollars now waiting for him. All right, because he, when he, they're going to say, man, that guy, we're going to put him on there. He's going to be five times better than Tony Romo. That's what they're saying. I mean, this, this is the ultimate color analyst. I hope it doesn't turn out to be Drew Brees because he's now basically done now with NBC. All right, but, I mean, if they're going to 10... 10 years, $350 million. I hope he pans out. But, you know, Paul doesn't get a nice gig here when he's done preaching. He doesn't get the Tom Brady $350 million parachute. He says, this is what I preached, and this is why I'm suffering, for which I am suffering. I'm bound with chains as a criminal. But here's the interesting thing. They thought putting Paul in prison would end Christianity. But what does Paul say? I'm bound with chains as a criminal, but, the big but there, but the word of God is not bound. Does putting Paul in prison stop the spread of the gospel? No. No, because of guys like Timothy, Titus, Onesiphorus. These guys are going to take Paul's message and they're going to continue to preach. Why? Because they're not ashamed of the gospel of God. That's Romans chapter 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God because it's the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. And so he says, you know what? Therefore, verse 10, I will endure everything for the sake of the elect. Who's that? Ultimately, it's you. Paul suffered in prison so that what? you could hear the gospel. That's what he talks about in his letters. You know what? I would die. I'd gladly give up my life if it would save what? My people. My people. So that they would believe. 
uh, I will endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I'm, I'm willing to endure this. That's an interesting thing. He's willing to endure death so that me and you could live. That's, that's an amazing thing. It's, it's having an outlook bigger than what? Life. Myself. Yeah, and life, this life here on earth. That's, that's what sin is ultimately. It's all about me and my authentic self. I mean, I, I think we're living in one of the most selfish generations maybe that, that there's ever been. Now, granted, everything, there's nothing new under the sun, as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, and everybody's selfish. But, I mean, we're getting to the point where, I mean, it really truly is just all about me, myself, and I. I mean, it is something else. There's yes. No and there's no shame. That's, that's, what, that's what Paul says, they will glory in their shame. And in Romans chapter 1, he says, we're going we're gonna to be so sinful and indecent, but we're going to want everybody to put the good housekeeping seal of approval on it. Not only will I do it, but I want to make sure that everybody I know says that what I'm doing is okay. You're going to have to say what I'm doing is okay, no matter what it is. And that's, that's ultimately, I think, where we're at today. But Paul says, I'm willing to suffer. I'm enduring all of this. Why? For the sake of the elect, which is a picture ultimately of whom? Christ. He, he, he wasn't up there on the cross saying, Jesus is what I came down here for. Gosh, six hours hanging here, getting the tar beat out of me for the last 12 hours and everything else. This was why I came. This was a real joy. What a joy trip to come down to earth and to be crucified on the cross. I, I couldn't have scheduled more fun than the last 24 hours of Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. No, he didn't come down for himself. He came down for me and you, for us. And, and we're supposed to, what, follow in Jesus' footsteps. And the pastors are following in Jesus' footsteps. And, and Paul now is following in Jesus' footsteps. And he says in verse 11, this is why this saying is trustworthy. Now, here you get either a portion of a small section of another little creed in early Christendom, or, as many Bible commentators and theologians believe, this was a verse from a hymn that the early Christian church was singing. And so Paul is saying, well, remember what we sing in the liturgy on Sunday mornings when you go to church. If we, verse 11, we've got four if-then statements here. If this happens, then this happens. The first two deal with us. The second two deal, it starts with us and then goes to Christ. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If you're willing to what? Die for Christ, then you'll get to see Christ. It's, uh, pastor Sinkbile wrote a great book. It was a, he was a pastor in Milwaukee for many years, and then he went to the seminary in Fort Wayne. And now he's the guy that kind of started doxology, which is his advanced training for pastors that I go to. But he wrote a book here. I think it was back in the, I think it was the early 90s. It was entitled Dying to Live. Dying to Live. And it's a neat little book of understanding Lutheran theology in your daily life and what it means to be a, uh, a Christian and understanding sanctification, your holy life now in Christ. You actually die in order to live, which is based upon not only what Paul's saying here, but Paul's getting this, and it's probably a part of the liturgy of the early church in a hymn, but it comes from Jesus' statement, deny yourself, pick up the cross, and follow me. It comes from John the Baptist. I must decrease, Christ must increase. We have to die, and Jesus said you must die to self. You have to die to self. You're, 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 see, there's the thing. You don't want to be your authentic self. And that's where the Christian church is actually loving people by saying, no, 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 no. I don't want you to be your authentic self. Your authentic self is a sinner. And that will take you to hell eternally. But Jesus, out of great love, became and saved you from yourself. If, if, so if we die with Christ, 
and our sin dies with Christ on the cross, then what we will also live with him eternally. That's what I ultimately want, because I don't care if I, I live to be 120 years old. It's a very short time when you're dealing with eternity. If we die with him, we'll live with him. If we endure, because remember, we're going to share in, in the suffering, verse 3, share in the suffering, Timothy, is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If we endure, if we endure, then we'll get a chance to what? We'll reign with him, which is what we read Sunday in Revelation. We're going to become the kings. We want to become kings here on earth for a short time. How about being a king for all of eternity? I'll go for that. I'll be, I'll be, and I'll be a king with Christ. Now that's, and it will, will, will reign with him forever and ever because we were created actually to reign here on earth with him and actually be in charge. Man was put in charge of the earth. But man, Adam, didn't want to be in charge of the earth. He wanted to be in charge of the whole shooting match. And he just didn't want to be in charge of that little section where God put in there. He wanted to be in charge of everything. Everything. But the interesting thing is God has come now to put us back on the throne again and to put humanity back there where he should be and be restored in the true image of God again, being a perfect reflection of the love of God. If we endure, we will also reign with him. That's, that's the first two parts, or if you want to call it the first two lines of this hymn or the liturgy, deal with us. If we die with Christ, we'll live. If we endure, which means if we make it to the finish line, fight the good fight of faith, finish the race, we'll reign with him, which is what you know we get um, in Revelation. Paul talks about it in, in other spots, too, where he says, I'll make it to the end so that I can receive the victor's crown of life. I get crowned. That, that's, that's the amazing thing. When you, when you make it to heaven, you'll be crowned. You'll be crowned. But first you're going to have to go through, see this is what I love about Lutheran theology, it's biblical, but it's, it, it, it also deals with reality. We're going to have to go through suffering right now in tough times. First in this life, you have to go through the cross. Then in eternity, you get the crown. That's, that's what we've got there. But then we get, okay, what happens if we don't endure to the end? At the end of verse 12. If we deny him, what will happen? He'll deny us. Where does that come from? Jesus says, whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. That's, that's what we have there in Matthew's gospel. It's in Mark. That's a part of the confirmation, right? But if we confess him before men, he will also confess us before his Father in heaven. Now, so if we deny him, he will deny us, because that was always the big question that was put to the Christians once a year. Who are you going to say is Lord? Is Jesus Lord, or do you do the Heil Hitler? Do you say Caesar is Lord? And it'll, it'll cost you. I mean, that's where Adolf Hitler got it, because he thought he was the Third Reich. He was the next Roman Empire. Yeah, the first one was the First Reich, was the Roman Empire, then the Holy Roman Empire, and now Hitler was the Third Reich, the third big kingdom. And he just pulled everything from the Roman Empire. So he had to stand up there once a year and do the Heil Hitler. Hail Caesar. What did they call the German emperor before Hitler? The Kaiser. That's the German word for Caesar. So, you know, they just thought they're just another Caesar. So hail Hitler. Heil Hitler. Hail Caesar. Caesar is Lord. No, we say you're not Lord, Jesus is Lord. Then verse 13, this is a very interesting one. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Now, after hearing that in verse 12, you have to remember the people who are listening to this. This is so easy for us to say because we haven't had somebody pointing a gun at us yet and saying, if you, if you believe Jesus is Lord, and they've got it right to your temple, I'm going to pull the trigger. But first, before I pull the trigger, I'm going to pull the trigger on your wife and three kids. All right? So what are you going to do? See, this is nice when it's an academic exercise, but now you, they've, got your, they've got your wife and your kids over there. All right? So you believe Jesus is Lord? Okay, fine. But I'm going to, I'm going to blow away your wife and three kids here. Then I'll blow you away. But I'm going to make you watch it first. 
So it's a, it's a nice little academic exercise here, but now you have to remember these are people who are going to be fed to the lions in the, in, in the uh, arena, and the, the husbands, the, the men are trying to save their wife and kids, you know, as the lions are turned loose or the bears or whatever, or they got to fight, fight the gladiators and everything else. And so, I mean, this is, you have to put it in this context. And so they're also wondering, I don't know if I'm strong enough to what? To endure it, to make it through this. And there may be times where, do I have enough faith? Or I may fall away, kind of like Peter. Remember Peter? He, he denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. And it was, a, it was a momentary lapse. But who came to forgive him? Christ. Christ's forgiveness and his faithfulness endures forever. That there is also hope that what? Even if we have those momentary lapses where maybe I do deny him, that what? Jesus still is there to do what? Forgive. If we're faithless, he remains faithful. For he can't deny himself. And what was his promise? I will love you always. Just as he loved Peter. He didn't come back to Peter, which is what I would have done, and said, see, I told you so. Because in the upper room, he says, you all are going to ditch me. And Peter raised his hand and said, if there's anybody in this room that you can count on, man, it's me. I'm your wingman. I've got your back. These other clowns, I know they'll fall. But there's one person, and that's me. And he went down in a blaze of glory. All right, as a little girl took him down. I mean, that, I mean, he couldn't, that's why he wept bitterly, because he knew. And so just think of that's a part of the liturgy that you're singing. If, if there is that time when I do fall, if, if, if I remain, if, if I'm faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself his promises. I, the Lord, your, your God, do not change. I'm there to forgive. Which is why, as we get ready to close here today, we finish up this section. He says here in verse 14, remind them of these things. Now, who's the them? It's the pastors. The pastors. Remember, you're supposed to, you're supposed to entrust this to faithful men. Remind those guys of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words. Charge those pastors not to quarrel about a bunch of words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. This is why we know. It's why it was a trick question. If we would have read to the end, you would have known it wasn't the congregation because they're the hearers. So the them is the pastors. Remind them of these things. Charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, which will only ruin the people that you're preaching to. Because you have to remember, they're getting a bunch of young guys like Timothy. And, and Jason Zosky even, uh, we, we had Jason and Michelle over to eat. Oh, when was it here? Oh, it's almost a month ago now. And I just asked him about things, and he goes, you know, it's just kind of interesting that uh, we have such young pastors now. And, and they are young going out. These guys are 25, 26 years old. Jason's 50. He's my age. So, you know, Jason's doubled them in, in age because we've got a lot of young guys. Now, in my class, I was the young guy at 29. Everybody was second career. There were no young guys going into the ministry. There were just two guys in their 20s. That's about it. Three guys, maybe. Um, but most of my class was all second career guys. They, were, they, they all did their 20 years as cops, state troopers in the military. They had all done their 20 years. I'm done now. What am I going to do for another 20? So they went in to the, to the ministry. But the young guys, Jason said, bring an interesting mix to the whole thing. They've gone through our Concordias. They, they've got all of this knowledge. And he said, man, they are gung-ho for the truth. But the problem, he said, is not that they're gung-ho for the truth, but the problem is they're kind of combative. And, and they're out there, what? They see everything that's wrong with the world, everything else. We've got to go out there, and we've got to go hard at it. And he said, almost sometimes, what can be some of the problems is, is I'm out there, what, to win an argument. And I'm, I'm going to show, I've, I've got the scriptures, I've got everything else, 
and I'm going to stand for the truth. That's good. But the problem is, as we're going to see here as we go through this, winning an argument isn't going to bring anybody into the kingdom of God. We speak the truth, but we speak the truth in, in love. I'm not here to win an argument. I'm here to show you that Jesus loves you, and he died for you, and he wants to forgive you your sins. And so what, what is he saying? Remind these young pastors like you, Timothy, because we've got a bunch of, the next generation that we're handing it off to now is a bunch of 20-year-olds. It's the Tituses, Onesiphorus. It's the Timothys. All right, they're gung-ho. They're ready to roll. But the problem is, is they can just, we can get to the point where everything is, we're just arguing about what? Words. And Paul says, that's not going to do anybody any good. It's only going to ruin the hearers. Do your best. Now, the Greek there says, do your best. I don't know if that's the best translation there in verse 15. It's really pursue it with zeal and fervor. So what he's saying is, you young guys, it's kind of like if you walk to the seminary today, you young guys, it's awesome. The zeal, the fervor, the passion that you guys have. It's what we need. But remember, we're not there to argue with people. You're to present yourself to God as one approved. Whose approval are you seeking? That's always the question Jesus asks. It's what Paul asks in Galatian. Am I doing what I'm doing now to seek the approval of man or God? If I was seeking the approval of man, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. I'm here to seek God's approval. God's approval, not so much because we have to remember, my job is not to argue you into the kingdom of God. I have to remember that all I'm doing is planting seeds and watering. It's what a parent does. A parent has to do it. He has to plant seeds, or a mom has to plant seeds and water them. But who's the only person that can make them grow? That's also Paul. God says, I'm the only one that can do it. I'm the only one that can make them grow. And so your approval is not that everybody's seeing you're saying, gosh, this guy's so bright, he's so brilliant, he knows everything, his argumentation is so sound, he's got all the answers. And that's why a lot of pastors fall, because they think it's all about them. And man, I do know my stuff, and I've got zeal and fervor, and I'm always, I'm here on the truth, and this is it, and I am going to make sure that you know that I am always standing on the truth. But no, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed. Rightly handling the word of truth. Remember, you've been, you've been past this word of truth, the good deposit. Use it rightly. You know, Paul says, don't be ashamed of the gospel in Romans 1 because it's the power of God. It's where we get the English word dynamite in Greek. It's the dynamo of God. You, you've been given this power Use it correctly, rightly handling the word of truth. So many good Lutheran theologians, um, John Pless just wrote a book here a few years ago about preaching, and he grabbed this from uh, verse 15 about pastors rightly handling the word of truth. And Lutheran theologians have always seen that as, as properly distinguishing between law and gospel, which Luther said is the hardest thing for a pastor to do. When do you need to be preaching the law? When do you need to be preaching the gospel? Rightly dividing that word of truth. When do you think your people out there maybe need to be pushed a little bit with the law? Or maybe they're so beaten down right now they need to hear the gospel. That's, that's the hard part. And I think sometimes the young guys can come out like they've been shot out of the cannon. And they've got to learn how to rightly divide and handle that. And, there's, and there, I think there's something to say to that. Because I look back on it and I think, gosh, after 22 plus years now, gosh, I wish 15 years ago I would have handled that a little bit better. You know, I got a, I got a little bit better understanding on this now because I've been out and I've dealt with this a little bit more. But that's, that's what a pastor's supposed to be doing, which we see here in verse 16, avoid irreverent babble. And I think as pastors, we have to be very careful of that. Sometimes I think we can get up in the pulpit and you can show everybody, see how much I know. <laughs> and it can end up with what? Just a bunch of babble. Um, I was 
reading one of the books I was reading here to kind of get ready for this summer sermon series and stuff I was doing was talking about a great preacher in England who was so well educated and everything else. And this guy went out because they said, if you want to hear a guy preach about the fear of God, you got to go and hear this great preacher in England. And so this guy went there and he was he was a pastor and he listened at the end. He, he said, I had no clue what this guy, because I could tell, man, this guy's very educated and a smart guy. I had no clue what he was saying. So, so I started at the end, I just, as people were walking out, he started talking to his people. And he said, there was a group of older ladies there. So I went over and started asking him, well, what, what did the pastor say and everything else? And, and they go, well, we've been going to church here for 30 years, and he's been the pastor for 30 years. He's the most intelligent person on the face of the earth. And, and so what have, you, what have you gotten out of his sermons? And the one lady said, really not anything in 30 years. But he's very, he's very smart. He's very smart, and I'm sure he knows what he's talking about, but I don't have a clue what he's talking about. And, and the interesting thing here is that's what Paul is saying. Don't, don't, just a bunch of babble up there. Because if, they're, if, if you're not feeding it to them so they can understand it, what it's going to lead them into more and more ungodliness. Actually, the Greek word there kind of gives a connotation of godlessness. Because you're not actually giving them Jesus. You're giving them just a whole bunch of big words, and you're smart and intelligent and everything else. And then he says in verse 17, their, their talk will sp spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. He calls out again two pastors. Man, they must have been great preachers, but who knows? And, and what ends up happening? They can get so philosophical and everything else, they've swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. And they are upsetting the faith of some. Actually, the connotation is they're destroying the faith. They're destroying the faith. The resurrection's already happened. That's almost like we're in today. There's no, there's no bodily resurrection from the dead. So Easter Sunday, I get into the pulpit, like I said last week, and this is a time about turning over a new leaf. As the flowers come up, so in the midst of suffering and life, there's joy and there's hope. And God, God brings new days out of the old days. And we can come up and let me quote a poem to you from blah, 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 blah. And this is what Nathaniel, whatever, Hawthorne said. And, and we get up there and we just start talking about all this stuff. And people don't really rise from the dead. But this is, this is to bring hope like the phoenix out of the ashes. And we can, you know, we can have all of this stuff. And, and Paul says, well, what, what, what is that? What are they doing? They're, they're destroying the faith. You guys got to understand here, we're playing for keeps. And we're not up there where you get to show off your great intellect and your philosophical knowledge and everything else. Rightly handle the word of truth. Take again what has been given to you and pass it on so that what they know, Jesus Christ and him crucified for the forgiveness of sins and for your salvation. Yes, Kurt. It's probably the that United Church of Christ over there with that big banner. With, 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 the, with the flowers. With the, with I the drove flowers by that the other day. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know what? I drove by there because I went by the library, and the kids were with me, and I said, "Man, this is what this is what I'm at reading in Second Timothy right now." I said, "There is the with true the, example the of it." With the thing over it. Yeah, just yeah. as the flowers come up and bring new hope, the resurrection, and it does bring hope, but it's it's that type of stuff here that Paul's talking he says, about. He could have easily said, "As Christ rose." Right. Right, because I am the resurrection of life. Let's put that up there. Right. Not that the flowers are coming up and they're bringing us hope. But that's, that's exactly what Paul's talking about here. We got all these creative things and everything else. And see, that's not divisive by, by talking about flowers. But when you actually say somebody rose from the dead and your eternal life now is based upon that person who rose from the dead, and everybody's going to rise from the dead. Now we start talking about stuff that a lot of people don't believe in anymore. And you're going to look like a complete fool. Because when Paul went and preached in the book of Acts, and he went to all these places, and to the Areopagus and Athens, and he went all over and talked to Festus and Felix, the Roman governors and everything else, and they said, this guy's nuts because he keeps talking about people are going to rise from the dead. Nobody believes people are going to rise from the dead. I mean, you are a moron. That's fairy tale stuff. I have never seen anybody come out of a grave. When they're dead, they're dead. That's scientific fact. 
I don't know what you're, you got some babble. You're just, you're, you're just a nutcase. And see, that's what Paul is talking about. It's easier to get up here and talk about flowers and there's hope and you, there's a brighter day tomorrow and all this sort of stuff. And Paul says, that's not going to do anybody any good. It's actually destroying their faith. So verse 19, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from sin and iniquity. If you claim the name of Jesus, everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from sin. The Lord knows who are his. Especially for the pastors, if you claim the name of Christian, you better act and confess like one. You're, you're, you're up there in the pulpit. you got a job to do. All right? Get up there and get the job done. And then he has kind of a stern warning. Here in verse 20, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. The people 2,000 years ago would know what he's talking about. We have no clue. All right? Because we go into the bathroom, we've got a sink, and we've got a flush toilet. They didn't. And that's, that's you've got vessels of gold and silver. Then you've got wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. There he's talking about, you know, the chamber pots and everything else. They get tossed out. You've got, you've got some useful vessels, and you've got other ones that are dirty and unclean vessels. Let's keep reading. Verse 21, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel now for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Going back here to this stuff. Be useful. Be one of those gold and silver vessels as a pastor that's going to do what you were called to do with your devotion to duty, your discipline, your diligence, that now you can get something done, ready for every good work. So to do that, in the final couple of verses, here's what I said earlier we close with, Flee youthful passions. Don't be your authentic self. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the name of the Lord from a pure heart. There, what Paul is saying is, you as a pastor do it, but you're going to preach it too. It's what he told them in Acts 20. My pattern is he's telling the pastors in Ephesus when he's leaving, he says, I will never see you again. And we read that in our epistle and a couple weeks ago in our class here. I preached repentance and faith while I was here for three years. Repentance from sin, faith in Christ. All right, I'm going to run from my youthful passions. I'm going to turn away. I'm going to take off my sin. I'm going to turn from it. And I'm going to put on Christ. So it's turning away from sin, turning to Christ. Turning away is repentance. Turning to something is Christ. That's faith. I'm going to take off my sin, and I'm going to put on the righteousness of Christ. And the interesting thing is he says, first, you the pastors better do that, so that then you can teach others to do it. So have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they just breed quarrels. As a pastor, Major in the main things and the plain things. That's your job. That's your job. So the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Gentleness. Young pastors, you're out there always, all the time to win arguments rather than teach the truth. Here's what a pastor should do. Not be quarrelsome, be kind, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting opponents with gentleness. Because you know what? Who does the work? You, pastor? You, Timothy, or God? Correct his opponents with gentleness. Then what does it say? God may perhaps grant them repentance. Not you, Timothy. Now, that's something i got to drill into myself over and over and over again. It's not me. Both as a pastor and as a father. Because I think in both of those jobs, we always want to be in the results business. I want it just because you, it, it, it's the same thing. You as a father in a house want to make sure that your kids are going to make it to the finish line. I as a pastor want to make sure that all of you as God's spiritual children make it to the finish line. 
And you always want to sit here and think, did I say this right or did this right or this wrong or this? And anyway, the interesting thing is, is what? Who's doing the work? You do all of this that we just read in the final three verses, but then the results, who does the work? God may, perhaps. God may, Timothy. He may grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of truth. It's not you. It's not you. Jesus will do it. And may. That's a very interesting thing. Who knows? God may. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Only the Holy Spirit knows what's true and what's false, right? Right, and and God will ultimately, but God is the only one that can ultimately get us to turn and have faith. And that's the thing I think as we close, we have to remember. I think all of us are getting very frustrated, myself included, with just, I have to be honest, with the stupidity that we see on a daily basis in the news. I mean, it's just getting to be dumb. We're just, I mean, it's almost to the point where you're just wasting my time. I mean, this is getting to be silly that grown adults would be discussing some of this stuff. I mean, it's just, it's just silliness. All right. It's just, it's, it's just silliness. But you know, here's the interesting thing as we, as we look at this, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth that they may, verse 26, actually come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. His will. The world is actually held captive by the prince of the power of the air, which Jesus calls Satan. He's the prince of this world, the prince of the power of this air. And so the interesting thing is, these people are actually out there doing what by nature they are going to do because they're what? They're sinful. And ultimately, it's why Paul says in Ephesians, our fight isn't against flesh and blood. I think that's something important that we all have to remember. And pastors, the enemy isn't people. The enemy is Satan. You know, we're fighting against principalities, the powers of darkness in this world. And God is trying to get people to come to their senses and to escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. I will always remember there's a scene in the old Thrivent movie that was on Luther back in, gosh, what was that one, 2008 maybe? Uh, it was about the time of the Passion of the Christ and everything. We had all those movies running around. That was the Joseph Fiennes character. Uh, he did the one of Luther. And you have the person who kills himself and nobody will allow him to be buried in the church cemetery. And the Luther character there goes and says, we are going to bury him because he has been captured by the devil. And done. he's done what he himself would not do. And by the grace of God, he can be saved. And I'll always remember that. And he's digging, you know, he goes, I will dig the grave. Because there wasn't anybody there, the, the, the town elders, the people in the church, the mortuary guy, nobody. This is somebody who committed suicide. I am not. They've automatically gone to hell. And Luther is there digging the grave, and he gives them a Christian funeral. Now, people have tried to say, is that based upon some real historical events? And it's kind of some stuff pieced together. But Luther, Luther kind of talked about that, that sometimes people can be what? They're captured by the devil. I mean, we had one of our very famous Lutheran pastors and pastors' families um, who's, uh, he was a pastor whose wife actually was a Lutheran school teacher, and she took her life. And then he wrote a book that I hand out to family members um, and, and talked about that. Our synod wouldn't publish it. The Wisconsin synod actually published it, but, uh, which was very interesting. But his whole point was this same thing here at the end of verse 26. Uh, the, the, my wife was overcome by the snares of the devil with great depression and other things and was captured by him to do his will. And that, and that God can ultimately what? Save. She's baptized. She was in church. She was receiving the Lord's Supper. But in, in that one matter of time when she took her life, she was captured by Satan to do his will. And, and that's what I think we have to remember. Pastors have to remember that. We're not there to fight and win arguments and everything else. We're there to what Paul says, bring people the medicine, bring them the cure, bring them the solution 
the left to yourselves. We're, we're destroying ourselves because we've, been, we, we've lost our minds, we've lost our senses, and we've been captured by Satan now to do his will. And all you got to do is turn on your TV, and you can see a world now that's just captured by him. And we need to preach Christ who's coming, not, not to give you freedom to do what you want to do, which isn't freedom, it's slavery. He's coming to provide freedom to loose you from these bounds of sin so that now you can be set free. And, and that's, what, that's what the church is here for. That's what pastors are here for. And that's where we'll pick it up next Wednesday, and we'll close with 3 and 4 because it all flows together very quickly here. Paul's going to say, but understand these last days, boy, here's the times of difficulty, and there will be insanity. And we've re read that, and we'll go through. But then preach the scriptures because it's the power of God, and then you'll have the final thing come to me at the end that we're just going to read chapter 4 because it's mainly just Paul's last words of, of love and Timothy, please show up. So we'll, let's go ahead and close the word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you sent Jesus who has come to give us true freedom, to set us free from sin, death, and the power of the devil, and to open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would continue to produce faithful pastors, that you would be uh, with your church, that they would proclaim uh, the gospel of hope and love and forgiveness. Be with us, O oh Lord. Bless us and strengthen us. For into your hands we commend ourselves. Give me thanks for all of your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.